Thanks for joining us for an Every Nation Sunday Sermon. This message is from our Hammersmith congregation. For more information on our church, or to see how you can be involved, please visit everynation.co.uk. When I say knock, knock, what do you say? I'm not going to go there. But when somebody knocks on your door, before you open it, you want to be sure you know who's on the other side. I knocked on my neighbor's door the other day. Um, It was dark already. I went to the door. I had a parcel that had been delivered for me, so I wanted to take it over to them. And it was dark, and there was a light on upstairs. And I sort of looked up, and I saw the curtain open up. You know that moment when, when, when somebody's looked, and you're not sure whether they've seen you, you saw that they saw. The curtain just closed again, and nobody came to the door. Later, I discovered that it was actually their daughter, whom I know well, but because it was dark, she hadn't recognized me, and she's been well-trained not to open a door to strangers. And so she never opened the door because her parents weren't at home. Wise kid. There are some things that will come to your door, opportunities, people, that you should not open the door to. But there is one who will come to your door, and he will knock at your door, and he will say this to you. He'll say, look, behold, I stand at the door and knock. This is Jesus speaking. If you will open the door, Revelation 3.20, right? The last chapter of the Bible. If you will open the door, what's he say? If you will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and share a meal together as friends. I will have intimacy with you. I will join myself to you. We will be one. Jesus says, I'm standing at the door. I'm knocking. Will you let me in? Now, here's the deal. Depending on what you know or what you believe about somebody is going to determine how eager you are to let them in. Is that true? The way you relate to somebody is totally dependent on what you know about them or believe about them. If you know there's an axe murderer at your door, you will not let them in. You know, some of you don't, you hear, you you see someone looking like a Jehovah's Witness, you don't let them in. You see someone who's a salesperson, you just know, you know, know, there's some people you just don't want to let in. And some of us, And some of you don't let Jesus in because you don't know him. You're afraid of him. You say, well, maybe maybe I've let him into my life uh, in in some way, but but you haven't let him in that he's kind of totally moved in with you into every area of your life. And to be open to God, when we talk about, and this is what we're going to talk about today, to be open to God basically means to fully trust him in everything. To fully trust him. The way what we believe about him totally determines how we will open the door to him. And I want to encourage you today, God is knocking at your door and he says, will you open to let me in? Now one of the challenges we have about God is that since, since the serpent lied to Adam and Eve, The devil has been lying to you and I and everybody who's ever been born about who God is and what he's like. Did God really say, you mustn't eat? He's just trying to limit you. Don't believe him. There is another way. Don't don't believe him. Don't trust him. He's not good. The devil has been lying ever since, and he's still doing it today. Scripture says that the God of this age blinds the eyes of those who don't believe so that they cannot see the glory of God. They cannot see God in Christ. They cannot see what it's all. They can't see the goodness, the graciousness of God. And I want to tell you today, friend, do not be deceived about who God is and who God ain't. When he knocks at the door, will you, will you confidently open, fully trusting him? 
And I just want to say, if you knew him, if you really knew him, you would fling open that door, man. If you knew him, if you really knew his heart, you would, you would respond to him like crazy. That's why the Apostle Paul prays for the church in Ephesus in the book of Ephesians. He prays this prayer. He says, oh man, I'm praying for you guys that God would, that, that your spiritual eyes would be opened, that you would see God for who He really is, that you would see the awesome inheritance He has for you, that you would see Him and the power that God worked when He raised Christ from the dead, seated Him far above all. Everyone say far above all. Far above all principalities, powers, rulers, dominions, the names that can be named. He says, man, I need, I want, and I pray that you'll know Him better. Because if you knew Him, friend, you would fling open the door of every area of your life without hesitation. A guy called um, <clears throat> J. Elder Cumming, he said this, in almost every case, the beginning of new blessing is a new revelation of the character of God. In almost every way, because you have to have the revelation in order to step into, in faith, to respond to God. In almost every case, the beginning of new blessing is a new revelation of the character of God. That's why you and I, every, every day we should be saying, God, open my eyes to see you more, to know you more. Because that's the beginning of blessing. His character, more beautiful, more wonderful, more precious. Listen, God is infinite. You do not know God as He can be known yet. There's more. He's, he's multi. He's, he's, he's amazing. And the new blessing to you in my life and our lives is when we have a revelation of who He really is. And when we do that, and we might say, well, where can we get to know Him? Give, him, give me a glimpse of him, of him today, Wolfie. Well, let's go to a scripture in John 10, verse uh, 9 and 10. This is our text for today. In context, in chapter 10 there in, 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 uh, in John, he's talking about the, him being the great shepherd. I am the shepherd who lays down his sheep. But then we get to this verse 9, and this is what he says. He says, I am the door. So Jesus is at the door, and he's saying, I am in the door. There's a door at your door. And then he says this. He says, whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I, Jesus says, have come that you might have life and you would have it more abundantly or you will have it in its fullness. He says, man, I've come to give you life. I'm at your door to give you life. As we look at this text, we're gonna, I just want to help you to understand who's really at your door and knocking. Because <laughs> if you knew who's at your door, you would fling it open and whatever he's got for you, you can receive because you've opened the door. And I want to encourage you, just, just put your eye, hand on your eyes right now if you, and just say, God, open my eyes to know you more. Right from this scripture, God can just come. I know that you think I'm weird, but you just, you just got to do some weird things, something to go through some doors. Some of you need a little, be a little, bo just be willing to be a little bolder, a little, bit crazy this year. Some of you are too, you're too concerned about your reputation, your image. What, they, what, will they, what do they think of me if I go a little crazy, if I do some crazy stuff? They think you're crazy anyway, so <laughs> you, you just don't know it. Who is, will you open the door of your life to him fully? Or maybe for the first time, maybe you're here and you're like, who is this Jesus? Who's at my door? Wolfgang's telling me he's at my door. Now here we go. From the scripture, a couple of things you, you can just, just, just know. Three things you can know about him. First of all, he says, I'm the door. So, you know, if you call me up or if you come to my door knocking and, 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 uh, and you ask who's there, or I come to your door and knocking and you ask me who's there, I'm going to say something. If I, if I know you, I'm going to say, Wolfie's here. All right? If I don't know you so well, I'm going to say, it's Wolfgang. <laughs> if I want to scare you, I'm going to say, it's the wolf. <laughs> if I need to be pastoral, I'll say, it's, wolf, it's Pastor Wolf. <laughs> now, that doesn't sound so good. That's, that's mixed metaphors, they're not working. 
It's Pastor Wolfie. That, that's like if I really want to be kind. If I need to discipline you, it's Pastor Wolfgang. <laughs> if I need to do business with you, and I, it's, it's, it's Wolfgang from every nation, London. It sounds like a little weighty. If it's my mother, I say, hello, Muti. If it's Ali, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> but when Jesus comes to your door, friend, and he knocks and you say, who's there? This is how he answers, I am. And friend, when Jesus uttered those words seven times in the book of John, those religious people, the teachers of the law, the Pharisees who heard him, nearly had a heart attack. Because when Jesus announced, I am here, they, made ref they suddenly realized what he was claiming. In fact, in the book of John later on, they would accuse him of blasphemy. They would say, how can you, being a mere man, call yourself God, claim to be God? What Jesus was doing when he announced himself at the door was that I am God. He was using the same word, the great word for God that God said when Moses was sent to the Israelites and to the Egyptians to go and deliver them, to see them out of bondage into, into freedom. Moses said to him, God, I know, I'll, go, I'll, I'll go, but who shall I say is sending me? And God says, tell the Israelites and Pharaoh that I am sent you. And friends, from that day on, God said, listen, I am. I am is the great name of God that basically declares, I am eternal. I am everything you need in every situation. It is his one name. But friend, from that name, as I said, you don't know him like, you, like, you, like, you're, like he can be known. From that one name, those who experienced the I am called him Jehovah Jireh. They called him Jehovah Jireh, my provider. They called him Jehovah Shalom, my peace. They called him Jehovah Tzidkinu, my righteousness. They called him Jehovah Rapha, my healer. Those who experienced him said, wow, this is who he is. Friend, you have not yet experienced God like he can be experienced. And the I am is at your door. Jesus says in the New Testament, listen, I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection and the life. He says that to to Lazarus's family who think, man, it's all over. And God says, listen, it ain't over yet. I am the resurrection and the life. At the end of the book, Jesus says, listen, I once was dead, but now I am alive. He doesn't say, he doesn't knock on your door and say, hey, I was. He says, I am. I was dead. I am alive. And I hold the keys of death and hell. Here I am. I'm at your door. Will you let me in? Will you let me in? Who are you letting in? It's not just some Mickey Mouse parcel delivery neighbor that you're letting in, friend. When you say yes to Jesus, you're saying yes to God himself coming into your life. Some of his other names. You know, when, when God, when, when the Bible opens, it, it goes, how does the script, how does the, what's the first line in the Bible? In the beginning, God, Elohim, all right? Mighty God. This is, how the, this is how the Bible starts. God has no beginning. He's eternal. In the, in the beginning of this world, Elohim, the mighty, almighty name. This is, Elohim is like God's title name. Just move forward a little bit in the Bible to chapter 3, and Adam and Eve had sinned, and they separated from God, and it says the Lord, and that's where the word Jehovah comes in. Okay, this is like his personal name. Okay, Jehovah steps in, God comes to us, empties himself of his godness, comes to us, and ever since then he's been coming to us, coming to our door, coming to your door, offering to intervene in the situation that has separated you from everything that God created you to, to experience in life and to be in life. Isaiah then calls and he says, he, Isaiah the prophet, he looks forward and he says, you know, Jehovah came, to Adam and Eve, but uh, a son will be born to you, and you will call his name Emmanuel, God with us. The angel re re repeats that to, to Joseph when, when Mary's pregnant, he's engaged, so he doesn't know what's going on. He says, listen, take her as your wife. 
because what's in her is of the Holy Spirit and call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Call him Jesus because he will save the people from our sins. This is the one who's at our door, friend. He's at your door. Will you let him in? Man, I don't know but where you're at right now, but when I grew up, I did not know God like I needed to know him. I knew about him. People told me about him, these scary names. You know, there are some other names of God. They are quite scary. The Lord who smiteth thee. I went to a church once in London, and I was listening to the preacher, and literally they had these banners, you know, these quilted banners and stuff with all the names of God, you know, all the wonderful names. But right behind the preacher, there was the name of God that means the Lord who smiteth thee. I thought that wasn't the best name to put up there. I thought they should put it there for the preacher to see if he preaches some nonsense. <laughs> or preaches too long. <laughs> the Lord's going to smite thee. <laughs> I didn't know God. I knew about him. I knew, like, and I knew that I needed to do good things to be good with him, right with him, and try to be right with him. I never was did, or did feel good enough to be accepted. I don't know about you, but... You know, but then I heard the gospel, I heard the good news, I heard that, that his name is, is, is Jesus and he will take away our sins. And man, the, this, is, this is what changed my life. This is why at the age of 19, when, after school, when, when, I, when I heard the good news and I heard who really was at my door, I said, come in, Jesus, I trust you. And when you know him, friend, you will let him in. And when you, when you know him, you will let him into some areas where you need him where you currently keep him out. Friend, he's got something to say and do in every area of your life, and it is good. I am stands at your door. Will you let him in? The second thing you can see from the Scripture is, is he says, I am the door, all right? As I said just now, there's a door at your door. It's like when you open, you step into something that, is, that, that opens to, to life. And, and these are the three things he offers here. He says, listen... If I am the door, and when you, when you respond to me, if you enter through me, you will be what? Saved. Okay, you will be saved. That's an amazing, powerful word there. That's the word sozo in the Greek, which means not just I have got a ticket, a fire escape here to, you know, from hell, or I've got an eternal, you know, security. It means saved. I'm made whole, restored in every single way I can be. That's what it means. Sozo is like... I was cre the way I was created and what sin destroyed, man, when I'm saved, I'm able to step fully back into the wholeness in which I was created. God says, I am the dawn. Through me, you get sozo. Then he says, he says uh, you, at the end, he says, I, I've come to give you life. That's also not just life. I'm alive. I'm breathing. Listen, that's more than a pulse, friend. That's got purpose in it. That's a life of, of passion and, and purpose. Zoe life is the God-intended life. It's the life that originates with God that was given to you. And in Jesus, that is restored to you. Do you want that? That's what he offers. That's, that's through the door. Then he says, I love this. He says also, he says, you will go in and out and find pasture. You just go to, just, don't just go in and, and that's it. You go in, he, you, 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 you commune with God. And then he says, through me, you go in and out. Man, we live and we find pasture. We live our lives in the door with him. All, wherever you go into, out of, he's there. He says, I'm going to lead you to pasture. This is what they, and in context, yeah, it's all about the shepherd. So when maybe you can think about Psalm 23. How's that start? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I have everything I need. He makes me to lie down in green pastures beside still waters. He restores my soul. That's some of that sozo stuff going on there. He restores my soul. What is it, how does it carry on from there? Shabbatabadabashetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetetet
And then it carries on like this. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Man, when you go through the door, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Man, when you can I go through that door, wow, what he offers us. Zoe, sozo, pastures, it's amazing. I mean, God, in Christ alone, you are offered everything that your heart truly desires. What you were created for is in Christ. And you're going to get offers from a lot of places, friend. You've got to choose which one you're going to, where, where you're going to buy, where you're going to give yourself to, where you're going to look. Um, I'll leave this out for the sake of time, but read Romans chapter 5, verse 1 in the message translation. In the regular translation, it's, it's through faith in Christ we have peace with God. Isn't that beautiful? But let me just read from a, a bit of it. By entering through faith into what God has always wanted to do for us, by entering in faith, we have peace with God because of what Christ, our Lord, has done for us. And then he says this, and that's not all. We throw open our doors to God and discover this at the same moment that he has already thrown open his door to us. When you open your door, you think like, wow, I'm really sacrificing. But when you open your door, you realize, man, he's done it all for me already. And then he says, we find ourselves standing where we always hoped we might stand. Because there's something in us that's looking for what we were created to be. There's something in us that yearns. We have eternity in our hearts. We find ourselves standing where we always hoped we might stand. Out in the wide open spaces of God's grace and glory. There would be an awesome open verse for you. We're standing in the wide open spaces of God's grace and glory, standing tall and shouting out our praise. Friends, that's what, when you go through the door, that's where you end up. Don't misunderstand, narrow is the door and few find it. Just because the door is narrow does not mean that the life that you find when you go through the narrow door is narrow. It is a wide, open, spacious life full of everything that you and I and us ever desired in our hearts. This is life in all its fullness once you go through the narrow door. Don't think you're like a camel that squeezes through the eye of the needle and you end up on the other side with nothing. And that's life, friend. You will end up on the other side with none of your stuff, but everything of God's stuff. I want to encourage you, when he's knocking at your door, he is the door to everything you ever needed and wanted and sought in your life. Lastly, what... what yeah, could have put that up there, I guess. Um, he is not the only a door, friend. He is the door. This is a radical claim of Jesus. This is a, a, a radical claim of Jesus. It's radically exclusive. Like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's, that's exclusive, isn't it? Now, listen, I was speaking to a Buddhist the other day, and he told me that there was no way I could convert to be a Buddhist. He said, look, you can't be one. You aren't born one or, I guess, reborn one, um, reincarnated one. Then um, you can't be one. So I said, that's, that, that's terrible. I was being another fr a friend of mine from uh, Syria, and he's of a, of a, of a not, not a Muslim, but of a Muslim sort of sect. And he also told me the same thing. He told me about his faith. I asked him about it. Very interesting how they started. But he, and he was in a bit of a dilemma because he's engaged. He, he wants to marry a girl, but if he marries her, he gets excommunicated from his faith. I said, well, how do you, how do you get into the faith? I mean, I know how you can get out of it, but how do you get into it? <laughs> he said, you can't unless you're born in it. That's exclusive, isn't it? But friend... Although Jesus is radically exclusive in that he's the only way, he's radically inclusive in that everybody can come. Everybody can come. You can come. Your friends, your neighbors, your colleagues, everybody can come. You can come. That's the great invitation of Jesus. Everybody. Whoever's thirsty, come. Are you thirsty? You can come. Whoever's weary, you can come. Whoever wants to follow me, and I'll lead you to life. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. You know, and, and I want to encourage you, don't treat him like this. Don't live like this. Okay, this is like a picture of a gate, and then there's just a, a road around the gate. 
You know, this are some people, some, of, some people, I know none of us here, but some people treat Jesus like this. Yeah, he's the gate. I've got the gate, but I'm, I'm going my own way. I don't really need the gate. You've got to decide, friend, whether you need the gate or not. You've got to decide whether you need the gate or not. Jesus says, come through me. You see, you see the, the other thing about it is, Jesus isn't the only one knocking on your door. In that scripture, he says, listen, the devil has come to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come to give you life. You need to be watchful for the devil who's sitting at your door. Don't give him the keys. The reason sometimes Jesus doesn't come in because the devil's already in there. And you're not inviting Jesus in to come and sort him out. I said ever since Adam and Eve, Satan has been lying to them about God. But at the same time, ever since then, the devil has been sitting right at the door. That's what, he, what God says to Cain when Cain is about to sin. He says, Cain, sin lies at your door. Its desire is to rule over you. In worship today, we had a word that sin will not rule over us. And God warns, warns Cain. He says, sin lies at your door. Its desire is to rule over you. But you should rule over it. And when you're at the door, friend, when you, wanna, when, when you hear the knock, don't open for anyone. Don't open for the devil. I had a friend of mine this week. He left his bicycle down the road in Fulham over here. He thought he was locking it, but he, he did lock it, but he left the key in the lock. What a picture. You know, what a picture. I do all the right things. I do a lot of religious stuff, but then I leave the key in the door for the devil to steal the thing. So, of course, the devil stole his bike. <laughs> do you see the devil riding around on a bike? <laughs> Let me know. Friend, the thief comes to steal. That's, that's, that's the mission of the devil. He's stealing from you. He's killing. He's destroying. That's, that's what the devil does. God doesn't steal, God doesn't kill, God doesn't destroy. God gives life. And you and I need to choose. And I'll end this. This is what C.S. Lewis says. There is one road that leads home. There are many roads that lead to the wilderness. Friend, I want to encourage you, as we go into this year, as you go into this next season, have you taken the road, the way, Jesus, to life? Have you, have, you, have you chosen that? If you don't take this road, you see there are many roads that you can try. And, you, and when you don't take Jesus as the way, as the one who leads you to Zoe and to Sozo and to pastures, you will roam this earth looking for eating and drinking to satisfy you. You will look for, for love in all the wrong places and never find it and never be satisfied. But friend, when you surrender, and we spoke about surrendering today, when you say, God, here I am, I trust you fully, come in. He's got an amazing, amazing promise for you. This is what he says in 1 Corinthians 16. Our master Jesus has his arms wide open for you. I just want to say that to you. Our master Jesus has his arms wide open for you. Will you run into them? Dan said we should give ourselves a little Christian side hug today when we, we welcomed each other. Oh, there was Dave. Okay, Dan did not take responsibility for that. I'm just... <laughs> hey, listen, God ain't into side hugs, friend. When you come home as a prodigal, how does the father respond? When you've screwed up and messed up and spent everything, how does the father respond? He's not like, hey, give me a side hug. The Bible says when the son came home, the father saw him from a distance. He ran to him. What did he do? I was like, hey, welcome home, son. No, it says he threw himself around his neck, kissed him, had compassion on him, said, quickly, servants, restore this man. Give him a ring, a row, give him some sandals, throw a party. Friend, that's the heart of the Father. When you open the door, that's what you run into. His arms are wide open for you. Ellie, won't you come up here and share a verse as we close from Ephesians? We're going to take communion in a moment, and I want to encourage you to think about your own, where you're at yourself and how you would respond to open your life to God today. Maybe it's the first time you're going to do that, to say, God, here I am. I surrender my life to you. Come in. Or maybe you need to recommit and 
surrender in an area, but do it because you know the one who's at your door. Okay, so this is um, Ephesians 3 in the message, 3.14. Because my, my response is to get down on my knees before the Father, this magnificent Father, who parcels out all heaven and earth. I ask him to strengthen you by his spirit, not a brute strength, but a glorious inner strength, that Christ will live in you as you open the door and invite him in. And I ask him that with both feet planted firmly on love, you'll be able to take in with all the followers of Jesus the extravagant dimensions of Christ's love. Reach out and experience the breadth, test its length, plumb the depths, rise to the heights, live full lives, full in the fullness of God. Wow. Let's stand together. Thank you.